for a long time, but I don't think I've ever seen this many people in our sanctuary. <laughs> we um, hope you, now that you know where we're at, we hope you'll come back. Because we have fun every Sunday. It gets this loud every Sunday. Everybody's so happy to see each other. Um, just a few announcements. Um, we're having a luncheon today over at the um, other building. Knock that over. And everybody's welcome to join us. We have lots of food over there. And hopefully Grady and his wife will be joining us. Um, and then um, last Sunday morning I had a prayer request for Jack Childs. His wife was the uh, previous pastor. And he had been taken to hospice. And that night when I got home, I had an email from Pam that he passed away. So it was very quick. And he's at rest now. Um, they're going to have a memorial service on March the 9th, which is a Saturday at 11 o'clock. And it's going to be held here at the church. So um, we hope you can plan to be there for them. And then um, on March the 16th, um, at our United Methodist Children's Home up in Enterprise, north of Orlando, is having their annual day on campus. And as part of that, they'll have tours of the property. They're going to have some breakout sessions, which I'm trying to get the details on. Then they'll have a program, and there's going to be a picnic lunch. Um, I'm hoping we can get some people to go, and I'm going to be working on trying to get some transportation because I know some of you don't want to do that long drive. So keep that on your mind. That's a Saturday. March the 16th, and of course you'll see it in a lot of my communications. Now, the reason we're all here today, <laughs> Grady Judd, Sheriff Grady Judd. Um, I'm going to do his, his um, introduction right now so we can move along, but Grady began his career at the Polk County Sheriff's Office in 1972 as a dispatcher. That's the year I graduated from high school, by the way, Grady. <laughs> After transferring to the patrol division in 74, he quickly progressed through the ranks, holding every rank from sergeant to colonel, um, and Polk County overwhelmingly elected him to serve as sheriff in 2004, and he's been in office. Have you ever had anybody run against you? One time. <laughs> My brother was a long-haul trucker, and he said it was felt so good when he'd go into a truck stop to eat, and all the guys were talking about Grady Judd. Of course, we don't have to say Judd. Everybody knows who Grady is. Right? <laughs> um, Sheriff Judd's earned higher education degrees through the master's level, having obtained both master's and bachelor's degrees from Rollins College. He's a graduate of the FBI National Academy, the Senior Management Institute for Police, the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Seminar, and the FBI National Executive Institute. He was a participant of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs Law Enforcement Exchange Program. He has taught as an adjunct professor at both the University of South Florida and Florida Southern College. He's a Polk County School Board Hall of Fame inductee, past recipient of Polk State College's prestigious Distinguished Alumni Award, the 2008 Boy Scouts of America Distinguished Citizen Award, Protect Our Children, Johnny, is that how that's pronounced? Um, award and the two, 2013 Calios Leaders in Online Child Protection Award, as well as the 2013 Church Women United Human Rights Award. He's past president of the Florida Sheriff's Association and the Major County Sheriffs of America, a national organization serving counties with a population of 500,000 or more. That's hard to believe that Lakeland fits into that category, <laughs> or Polk County. Um, Grady has been married to Marissa, who happens to be with us today, and um, since 1972, and they have two adult sons, and I have to ask, is this a typo? 13 grandchildren? <laughs> two kids and 13 grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> so we're so glad to have you here today, and we're going to um, start up with our service, and then he'll be doing the spending time time with us during the sermon period. Thank you. Surely the presence 
presence of the Lord is in this place. We can feel his mighty power and his grace. We can hear the brush of angels when we see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of Surely the presence, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Please stand for the call to worship. Some of my stuff. Day by day, God leads us. Day by day, Jesus calls us. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us. Our song of preparation is Majesty, Worship is Majesty, 178 in the hymnal. Test, test, test. Majesty, Worship is Majesty. Unto Now for our affirmation of faith, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he arose again, and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now is the time for our uh, joys and concerns. Yes. Couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear the name. Anybody else? Mary?
Anybody else? Yes, Rosa? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Congratulations. Anybody else? Please join us in our morning prayer. Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, you know our hearts, you know our concerns, you know our joys. We lift up all of those things, Father, that may not have been spoken today, but the things that weigh heavy on us, you know those things. Those things that bring us joy that we did not speak of today, we are so thankful for that joy. And Father, for the things that, that we spoke of, the anniversaries, 57 years, we're so grateful. For the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, Father, those are blessings from you. We're thankful for our family who travel from other states and other places to be with us today. We pray for travel mercies, Father, as they travel back home or to other destinations. We're thankful for our guest speaker today, Father, and we know that you have given him words to speak to us directly from you today. We lift up our friend Mark, who has surgery scheduled, and our friend Joe. We pray, Father, that you will be with them during the time, the doctors, the nurses, all the medical staff, Father. We pray that you will control the hand and guide every move in those procedures. We lift them up for a quick recovery, a healthy recovery. But most of all, Father, we are just thankful. We are thankful for all things. All things that you have blessed us with. All things that you walk through with us. And I ask my friends to join me, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to turn our hearts to a time of giving, and then we're going to turn, um, we're going to do some worship, and then we're going to turn it over to Grady Judd.
We now have a special song, It Is No Secret, by Larry Allen. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I think they're getting it set up back there. It's good to see you all today. Especially you, Brady. Thanks for being here. I think he's got me turned down a little bit better. Don't worry. When I start singing, you'll hear me. The chimes of time bring out the new another day Someone slipped and fell Was that someone you? You may have long or added strength your courage to renew do not be disheartened for I will you it is no secret God can do what he's done for others he'll do for you with arms wide open he'll pardon you It is no secret what God can do. There is no night, for in his light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you when God is on your side. Take him at his promise don't run away and hide it is no secret what god can do what he's done for others he'll do for you With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do.
Grady, we give you the floor, or the pulpit. It is truly my honor to be your sheriff and to be with you today. And some may say, well, you know, I'm visiting from up north. Well, as long as you're in Polk County, I'm your sheriff. <laughs> you know, I'm going to speak today about just because you can doesn't mean you should. The country has more angst and haters on TV and social media than ever before. Do you like to see that conduct? Do you wonder what happened to common decency and respect? If you believe what is perpetuated by social media, reality TV shows, you'd think the world we live in is a drama-filled, caustic environment filled only with haters. Haters who feed into the culture already feeling the impact of the negative national media rhetoric who are trying with every ounce of their ability to get ahead of the story before it goes viral on social media. Even beyond the online frenzy, this negative, backbiting attitude can be seen at our nation's capital. Democrats and Republicans are fighting with each other over political and philosophical platforms, ignoring the real issues and what their decisions mean for their constituents, us, and our country. And this idea of mainstream media only perpetuates hate by giving airtime only to the extreme left and the extreme right, which doesn't represent all of us at all. They argue and they sling mud even when they should be providing an unbiased evaluation of the issues this country is facing. Negativity and scandalous behavior appears to be the new cultural norm. But the reality is, hate is nothing new. Jesus tells us in John 15, 18, and I'm going to read from the New International Version today. If my mother was here, I'd be reading from the old book because that was the only one, okay? But I understand this one better. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, and if you spend any amount of time in the New Testament, you'll see hordes of people who hated Jesus. King Herod the Great in Matthew chapter 2 at Jesus' birth. King Herod Antipas at Jesus' death in Luke 23. The members of a certain Samaritan city when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they speak of that in Luke chapter 9. The Sadducees, the Pharisees plotted against Jesus throughout his ministry. And even one of his own 12 disciples, Judas, in his greed and for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed Jesus in such a horrific way that it led to his torture and ultimate death. Out of his own best friends, one doubted him, one betrayed him, and one denied him. Let me tell you now, if Jesus can't even have a loyalty while on this earth, it's not looking good for the rest of us. But God doesn't approve of the hate and the disrespect. So what would Jesus want us to do? He would tell us we can change this current hating environment, and I believe that's exactly what Jesus wants. And change is defined as a refreshingly new or different experience. Now, do you remember the old saying, there's only two things we really don't like in life. That's change and the way we're currently doing things. And positive change can occur when we work together. Let's look at a few things that have changed in our lifetime. Well, some of our lifetime. Consider how we listen to music, for instance. Now, some of you are old enough to remember, I can tell by looking around, like me, vinyl records first appeared in the 1940s. And then cassette tapes in the early 1960s made their debut. 
And then it was the compact disc in the early 1980s. And now it's digital format that appeared in the 90s. And digital format is now how we listen to most music today. You can link up to the cloud, which I really don't understand. You know, you can play your favorite Elvis tunes. Heck, new cars don't even have CD players anymore. While many things have and will continue to change from year to year, there are some things that never go out of style. A com common decency to begin with. A courteous attitude. Treating everyone with compassion and dignity. But those things don't just happen. People make them make it happen. It is a learned behavior. For example, I remember my mom would often tell me, and I bet yours did too, if you can't say anything nice about someone, don't say anything at all. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. In other words, just because you can doesn't mean you should. The majority of the people in society are good, God-fearing, hard-working folks who pray together, play together, work together, love God together. But you know what? They don't get any attention because they're not fanatical and out on the edges. But let me quote a study by Danielle Story. She was the CEO of Eastern Innovation Business Center. She conducted this national survey and asked people, you know, what do you want? What do you want most from life? And here's the top three answers. They want happiness. They want health. And they're less the last three were peace, contentment, harmony. And they used both, all three words. Did you notice that the top answers weren't millions of dollars or to retire to a cabin in the mountains? It wasn't to be a famous social media star, but it was to be happy, healthy, and satisfied. So how do we get there? Hebrews 10.36 tells us, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see, we stay in God's will, we read God's word, and we follow his direction. God's word isn't a magic eight ball. Now, you young folks have no idea what I'm talking about. But the older ones remember, right? The magic eight ball, you turned it over and there was the answer. So the answers aren't always quick and easy. But God's words provides the right answer at the right moment in your life. And the more you seek God in everything you do, the more we know his heart and his direction for our life. So if you're not staying in God's will, you need to change. Let's take a moment. Go to a familiar Old Testament story. The story of Noah as it's found in Genesis chapter 6. Noah had to change his future plans. You see, God was pretty upset with mankind so much that the scripture tells us he was sorry that he made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them. So you can see even the Lord makes changes. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And because of that favor, God told Noah his family would be saved. But he needed to build an ark. Even gave him specific plans. It was a carpenter's dream. Now understand, there were no bodies of water around. No rain. No obvious reason to build this big cypress wood boat. Now, can you picture it? 
all of his neighbors passing by, calling him that crazy 600-year-old man, probably telling his wife she needed to get him checked out. And Noah had three boys, and you know that they got teased, and everyone laughed and gossiped about Noah and his family. Now, can you imagine if such a circumstance happened today? Let me go over some of the national headlines that we would see and what they would say about Noah. 600-year-old man builds a big boat with no place to float it. Or how about this one? Noah claims to have heard directly from his so-called God. Or how about this one? Who is this Noah builds a ship in the middle of the desert? And the one that I like, certainly headlines for a long time, Noah builds a ship with Noah water around. We've seen all these caustic headlines, haven't we? It would have been easy for Noah to crumble under the ridicule and the negativity and the pressure launched against him and his family. And this boat wasn't built overnight. It took years and years, and he was ridiculed continuously, making him the target of mean-spirited, vile, caustic statements for decades. But he didn't give up. He didn't give in. He built the ark because that's what God led him to do. He changed the direction of his life to follow the will of God. And it was in the best interest of the world we live in today. And after the ark was completed, Noah loaded up seven pairs of every clean animal, one pair of every unclean animal, both male and female. Now you can see where this is going. God's so mad with mankind, he's going to start over. And then the first claps of thunder shook The skies opened up, the rain began to fall, and Noah's neighbors weren't laughing anymore. So as the water rose, in Genesis 7, 21 through 23, it tells us, and all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, All that was on dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And here's what Peter said about this. God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people eight and all, were saved through the water. Then after 40 days and 40 nights, another change occurred when the water receded from the face of the earth. Noah and his family made it to dry ground where they started over. And you know the rest of the story. Noah could have resisted this change and quit, but he knew he shouldn't, so he did what God said. He had to operate outside of his comfort zone to change the world, He did what was right. He listened to God and he obeyed. Noah was doing the right thing at the right time at God's direction. And all across this nation and even in our community, people today are still doing the right thing. But we don't hear about those stories on mainstream mainstream media. We don't hear about those stories with social media. All we hear is the ugly. We don't hear what's in the best interest of our family, our community, or our nation. Listen, people who are following the greatest commandment are doing well. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Even God saw a need for change when he destroyed the earth because of the way people were treating each other and a lack of common decency and respect and all kinds of wicked conduct. So let's get back to today. What do we do to change the world for better? So we don't have an environment that causes God to once again want to end the world. It's simple as being a friend and being a good neighbor. You know, like respecting each other. And it's the easy things. We think about these worldwide issues, but everything starts at home, in the family, respecting and loving each other, and then respecting and loving the community. I'll give you an example. When I was a young patrol deputy, my next door neighbor would get out and mow the yard at like 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, I was working on the midnight shift. That would be like me mowing my yard at 2 in the morning for him. But I had good neighbors because I was a good neighbor, and I went to him and I said, how do I handle this? So I went to him and I said, would it be okay if I mowed your yard when I woke up in the afternoon as opposed to you mowing your yard when I'm in the middle of my midnight? And he goes, oh, Grady, I had no idea. No, you can't mow my yard, but I'll quit mowing it at nine in the, 10 o'clock in the morning. So I tell folks, when you have trouble with neighbors, it's usually probably because you're not a good neighbor or you haven't gone above and beyond. If you have an issue with a neighbor, go directly to your neighbor. <laughs> Discuss it in an adult manner. Your first reaction should never be to call the cops unless, of course, you're physically threatened. Because let me tell you, when you start calling the cops on your neighbors, they don't like it very much. And then they want to get even. And once the government shows up, and you dial that 911 and the government shows up, we have a system that kicks in. About if this happens, we have to do that. If that happens, we have to do this. And usually nobody likes the outcome. I hearken back to my retired dad. I remember back in the day, he not only is he retired, he's deceased. So he's really retired. But he used to say, listen, the government's got an answer for all of your problems. But you're probably not going to like the answer. Solve your own problems. Solve it with your family and your friends and your church. My dad was a minister of music, and he said, the church is the energy of the community. We are the ones that should be the change agents, and it starts with each individual ones. Some of the biggest fights I ever went to in neighborhoods was over a neighbor allowing his pet to do his business in the neighbor's yard. And then, of course, the neighbor picks it up with a shovel and throws it back on his front porch. And as they sling excrement back and forth, you end up with a major event. Well, haven't we really created that kind of environment at a national level rather than to say, calm down? Or the neighbor has the dog that barks all night long when you're trying to sleep. So what, what am I talking about here when we have world stages and world issues? It all starts with us as an individual. You have to be nice. Sometimes you have to be nice when it's easier not to be nice. But when you lend a hand, you'd be surprised how much the barriers break down. Here's an email we received where one of my deputies was caught doing something he didn't have to do, but he knew he should do. He was loving his neighbor. Officer Acevedo responded to a call Saturday when I needed help. The kids asked for Tory badges, and he told them, I don't have any Tory badges. But the next night, he showed up with toys and Rice Krispie treats for my children between his calls. You see, that doesn't make the news. There's no media to that. There was no story, but we made a friend. 
these interactions are priceless. It's so important that we spend time with the younger generation because they're going to be the decision makers. And we want them to see us resolving issues the right way. Let me share one more example. For those of you who are old enough to remember Paul Harvey, I have to explain that now. He was a great editorial commentator on the radio for decades, a long time ago. But by the youngsters here, they he passed before they moved over. They won't know. We have to explain a lot of things. And then when they grow up, then they'll be explaining stuff too. But this is an example of just doing what's right. On one of his most famous broadcasts, Paul Harvey talked about Spring Arbor University's 1977 men's soccer team. The only undefeated team in the NAIA and the fourth ranked team in the nation that year was denied the right to participate in the national NAIA tournament because of religious principle. The team finished the season 19-0 including victories over Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, Western Michigan University, and Oakland. The Cougars only allowed 0.79 goals, less than one goal per game, and they racked up 11 shutouts. It was an outstanding team led by sophomore Howard Taylor, who scored 33 goals. But even with this outstanding record, the team was unable to play for the national championship because the finals were scheduled on a Sunday. A long-standing principle at SAU was, has been that the athletic teams do not participate in intercollegiate sports on Sunday. And scripture supports this in Exodus 28. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. At this time, the university would not compromise on this principle. The NAIA would not change their mind either. The soccer team never had the opportunity to compete for the NAIA championship when obviously they were the very best. When the University of President announced to the assembly that they wouldn't participate, his own students gave him a standing ovation. Now today, what would they do? Riot, go to social media, talk about how the university president doesn't have any brains and what's he doing here and it's time to fire him. But the students gave him a standing ovation because he stood for what was moral and correct. In response to national broadcasts and protests that actually made the news because it was so confounding, that someone actually stood up for what was right, the NAIA decided to change its policy and not schedule any games on Sunday. You see, they stood up for what was right, and their steadfast truth, faith led to the truth. It seems that they realized that just because you can doesn't mean you should. And Dr. Martin Luther King says, on some positions... Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? Change may not always be the popular thing to do, but when it's the right thing to do, we must do it. Otherwise, we're just adding to a caustic environment. And the government's not going to calm this caustic environment down. It's going to have to be the churches and the houses of faith and the God-fearing people that say, hey, wait a minute, this is not right. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, if I speak in tongues of men or of an angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. For love is patient. 
Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It's always, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And now we know this is what it means to love your neighbor. This is what it means to respect one another. This is what it means to change a caustic relationship. And this is what it means to have peace and harmony. As we close today, we live in the greatest nation in the entire world because it was founded based upon our Christian and God-fearing beliefs. We can never forget that. And we need to follow God's word and create an environment for peace. Remember, it begins with us personally. It begins at home and with our friends. And we can change the world. We've done it before. And we'll do it again. Change your life for the best. And influence others to change their life for the best. Harmony comes from understanding. Doesn't mean we have to always agree. If we always agree. Somebody's not thinking. It's simply seeing and respecting other people's opinion. Even when it's contrary to ours. This is how you practice choosing love over fear and choosing harmony over drama. I always loved the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. She was in office when my favorite president, Ronald Reagan, was. But she had some very wise words along this theme. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, because because they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. Through love, compassion, respect, understanding, and changing our negative thoughts and actions, we can not only remain in the center of God's world, we can also make sure that we do what God wants us to do, and that will spread. What you do and say and how you do it and say it determines who you are as a family, who we are as a community, who we are as a state and nation. God directs us to do that. Jesus directs us to do that. And together we can make this great country even greater than it is. May God continue to bless you and bless the United States of America. Thank you.
Well, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus set me free. Well, Jesus put a yodel, he put a yodel in my soul. Please join us for the hymn of response, Victory in Jesus, number 370 in the hymnal. Thank you for that message, Sheriff. Thank you for reminding us that we can be the change in a broken world. Thank you for reminding us to love our neighbor and to treat our neighbor the way we want to be treated. The benediction is going to serve as the blessing for our meal next door. We only ask that if someone is on a walker or a cane, that we let them leave first so that they can get next door without us knocking them over. Go in peace. Share the love that Christ shares with us. The grace that he has upon us, let us have that grace for our neighbor. 
Amen.